comfortable. So I close my eyes, and in my mind's eye, I escaped the bus so that I would feel more comfortable. And I start to see that the bus would, uh, as I rose above it, the bus would become a dot. And then I rose further, and I saw the earth becoming a dot. And then I rose further, and I saw the solar system becoming a dot. And I rose further again, and I saw the galaxy becoming a dot. And then I start to fly back in, into the galaxy, into the solar system, back to the Earth. And I located the bus I was in, and back into that bus, and back into my body. And I opened my eyes, and I looked at my hand, and I thought, oh, maybe I could fly into my hand. And then, so I closed my eyes again, and I thought of flying into my hand, and I saw that inside my hand would be dots that are called cells, and then inside those cells I would see millions and millions of other dots that are called atoms. I probably didn't even know what an atom was at the time. And I continued in, and I saw, you know, the nuclei of an atom that was made out of smaller dots, and then again smaller dots, and so on. And I thought, and, and then I got it. I had this moment of elimination. And then in the bus, you know, going back from school, oh, yes, the only solution to this riddle, the only way you can solve this, the only way you can, um, the, the only way you can visualize, understand dimension is if you'd make the exact opposite uh, axiom right from the, the beginning, which is that, the only thing that exists is the dot. So here, within the dot, is all dimensions. Within the dot, we have all the structure of space-time. Within the dot, all possible other dimensions became, became in existence. That's the way I saw it, meaning that if we continue to divide the dot, we could find smaller and smaller and smaller dots, and those would be like scales of dimensions. And that the only thing that exists is the dot. And it is only from your perspective that you define the scale at which you observe those dimensions. And I had to think about it, it's like, well, if it's true that infinity is, is compactified in every point, how is it that we have finite boundaries? How is it that things are not just falling into each other to infinity? And how is it that things exist? How do we define those boundaries? How do we have a finite space in an infinite potential? How can that be together? Now, it took me a while before I realized that there is a direct, an intricate link between infinities and finite boundaries. That these are not opposite concepts, but they actually are complementary. There is infinities to create infinite, uh, finite boundaries, and there's finite boundaries to create infinities. And in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to use a very simple initial graphic. Although this graphic is simple, it is still absolutely accurate to the geometry that we will see throughout the day today. It's not something in left field. It's something that's very important. So here we're going to do this. We're going to generate a finite boundary we're going to call a circle here. And this circle could be a 3D sphere that contains a very specific space. And in that sphere, or in that circle, we're going to put a triangle, an equal lateral triangle. Now, the universe is polarized. And the reason why things are polarized is because they spin. Okay, things in the universe are polarized because they spin. And angular momentum creates um, shafts of rotation that generates polarity. 
So if you have polarity, then you can accurately have a reverse triangle in that sphere or in that circle. Now, right away, we have one of the most common ancient symbols that we find all around the world, called the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon or um, the um, Six-Pointed Star. And that will go, we'll talk about this later on in the presentation, but just take notice of it. Now, we can continue to add triangles. And now we get smaller stars, baby stars of David, okay, baby six-pointed stars. We can continue to add other resolution of stars by adding more triangles. Again, smaller stars of David. Every time we create a new resolution, we can define a very specific boundary. This is very important. And here we find a second bound, a third boundary, so smaller and smaller sphere. We can continue to make smaller and smaller resolution of this geometry. And in fact, if I give this to my computer as a computer code, and I got it to make geometries maybe five resolution deep, and then zoom in, and then go five resolution deep again, and then zoom in, and then keep doing that, it, it would continue to do that to infinity. Uh, as long as the computer had power and chips would keep working in there, it would continue to make boundaries for thousands of years. However, I would never, ever, ever exceed the first boundary that I've set for myself. Within a finite system, I've demonstrated to you right now that you can create infinite numbers of division, infinite numbers of sets of information. Okay, if this is true, then if we look at a large scale in the universe, we should start to see very specific divisions. We should start to see structure. If the vacuum is dividing under very specific structure, then we should, should be able to see it. We should be able to calculate it from what we observe. So we decided to write a scale. What we did is we took the radius of objects. Okay, and so here on the X, um, in, in the X axis is the radius. And here is the frequency of these objects, the fundamental frequency of these objects in Hertz. Guys about this. So we place the, we place the data point for the universal, uh, I'm sorry, the 10 to the minus 17 is the universal uh, uh, frequency based on our calculation, and the radius is 10 to the 28. And when, and then we place the next data point for the, uh, for quasars. We're taking average size and frequencies of quasars. This is a very large scale, so it's acceptable. And we place the data point. And it surprised us. It was a fairly good linear progression from universal size. Then we place the data point for galactic centers. So we're getting smaller in scale. And again, an average galactic center oscillation rate and radius. And we place the data point. And again, linear progression. Then we place a data point for solar uh, dynamics, stellar dynamics. And we got a linear progression again. Um, that was astonishing. I mean, there is nothing in standard views that would predict that. Uh, either than the view I was getting that the vacuum is dividing itself under very specific structure boundaries. Then we went all the way to the atomic level with the radius and fundamental approximation of frequency for 
x-ray mission. And we got a data point that was a perfect linear progression, again, but this time a, across the boundary of quantum theory into the atomic level. So now we went from cosmological object to quantum theory level. And this is one of the fundamental fracture in our current physics. Quantum theory and relativistic physics don't agree. They don't work uh, for each other. So that was really exciting. And then we went all the way down to the Planck's links and, and placed the Planck's link uh, a dot um, uh, data point and at 10 to the minus 33. And sure enough, the progression was perfect. The other thing we noticed is that if you take the distance between the data point, which is kind of nice, it's, it's sweet, and you divide them, you always get very close approximation to the phi ratio. Uh, the phi ratio is 1.618 and is, you know, and goes to infinity. It's uh, typical to find it in nature everywhere. Uh, you find it in flowers and shells and pine cones. Uh, you find it uh, in the way tree divides. You find it in your body. The, the phi, there's a phi ratio between the end of your finger and the second part of your finger. And there's a phi ratio between the second part and the third part and your hand uh, re re relative to your fingers. And then your, your fingers and hand relative to your forearm. And your whole body is built like that and, and so on. And so you, you find it in nature everywhere. So to find it on a scale that's so large, was very exciting because it supported that this would be something that nature would naturally do. That space, that the vacuum would naturally divide itself under these very specific fundamental mathematics because we observe it in nature everywhere. Well, we were happy to find that if you place that data point for the biological cell on the graph, uh, it would bisect the graph approximately in the middle of the graph. That is, the biological resolution is the link between the large and the small. You are the event horizon. <laughs> Loosely termed. And you are the data transfer boundary from the extremely large to the extremely small. Isn't that what you do? You gather information and transfer it to your internal self, which in this view has infinite boundary potential. Thus, you're transferring that information through your boundary to the infinite of the universe within yourself.